Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Hey, this is Russ. You might remember that several days ago I mentioned that we were coming into a stretch of episodes where the audio production was lacking when I first recorded them. Well, this is one of those episodes. The content's fine, it's just the audio that's lacking, and, and it's on my list of episodes to re record in the future. And so as you listen, hopefully extend some grace for the audio quality, and please know that by the time we get to 1 Samuel, things will start sounding pretty normal. That's not very far away. So thanks for understanding, and here's today's episode. Today we're turning to Joshua chapter 3, where the people of God cross the Jordan River and enter the Promised Land, and just an incredible miracle of the Lord. So far as we've been going through the Bible, we've been reading this this record of the Jewish people. But the records that we've been reading have by and large taken place somewhere throughout the Middle East, but not in that little country of Israel. And yet in modern times, when we think of Jewish people, we think of them in the context of the nation of Israel. And so today we're going to be reading about the event that launched the fruition of God's promises to his people as they're about to enter into the promised land. So let's look at Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 1. In verse 1, they leave the Acacia Grove where they've been camping for quite some time. They're about 8 miles east of the Jordan River. And so they get on up and they move to the edge of the Jordan. And you can imagine that moving 2.5 million people 8 miles would have been a huge feat in any day and age. And so they get there and they're probably wiped on out and they camp. And so then in verse 2, the officers go throughout the people and they tell them, When you see us carrying the ark and heading to the river, follow us. And they say to leave 2,000 cubits, which is about 1,000 yards between them. And so the people are all excited about getting ready to cross the Jordan River. So some exciting stuff's about to happen. But before we get to that, I want to just pause for a moment and make a mention about the timing of this event. In verse 2, it mentions that this was after three days. And you might remember back in Joshua 1.10 that Joshua told the leaders they've got three days before they're going to head on out. And then you have the sequence of the spies with Rahab and another three days pass it there as well. So what gives with all these three days? Well, this touches upon an important principle that we often need to keep in mind when we're studying the Bible. But often, the biblical authors will arrange the chronology of their events according to priority or according to concept, not necessarily chronologically. Most of the time it is chronological, but there are times when it's not, and this is one of those times where you have all of these events that are probably happening nearly simultaneously, but each episode is given its own chapter so we can see what is happening as God's plan is unfolding for his people. And so the Lord wants us to know that in Joshua chapter 1, he is commissioning Joshua to now lead his people. Likewise, he wants us to know in Joshua chapter 2 that Rahab and and her faith in God was a key part of the deliverance or the conquest of the the people of God coming into the promised land. And then here we are in Joshua chapter 3, and the Lord wants us to know the miracle that went into bringing the Jewish people, the people of God, into the promised land. So going on. In verse 5, Joshua tells the Jewish people to consecrate themselves because they are about to enter the promised land and they're going to see wonders. The Lord's going to do wonders amongst their midst tomorrow. And so that idea of being consecrated or being sanctified just means to be fully dedicated to the Lord and to his work. It might mean washing clothes. It might mean abstaining from certain kinds of activities. The point is to say, I am fully dedicated to the Lord right now. He is my focus and he is my pursuit. Then down in verse 6, Joshua tells the priests to pick up the ark and and head on out. And the ark represented the presence of God. This was the ark of the covenant. You'll remember that God had made a covenant with them to give them this land. And they made a covenant with him to trust him and obey. And that's what they're doing. Uh, Despite how fearful they are of the people, they are trusting God. Their parents were just too afraid to even bother. This generation is going to trust and obey. Well, going on to verse 7, the Lord speaks to Joshua saying, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. And the Lord goes on to tell him about bringing the priests and having the priests stand in the middle of the Jordan River and all that went into that. And so Joshua calls the leaders of the tribes to him, and he tells them what the Lord is going to do. And he tells them the priests are going to bring the ark into the river. It's going to divide just like it did when Moses led the people across the Red Sea. Now, some of these people probably remember that. They were just kids at the time. Some of these people were never even born, and they're going to see this incredible miracle for themselves. And so it happens just as the Lord had told Joshua. When the priests step into the water, the waters, it says, rose up into a heap and stopped so that the people could walk across the Jordan on dry ground. This was a true miracle of the Lord. The Lord had stopped the waters all the way back at the city of Adam, which was about 15 miles north of where they were. 
And so they have this incredible miracle of the Lord. And we know it's a miracle for them because it said over in Joshua chapter 4 that when they crossed over, the waters came back. This wasn't just like some kind of natural phenomenon that took advantage of. It was just for them. The Lord provided it just for them so that they could cross. And so just as the Lord had worked through Moses, he is now working through Joshua. You might remember back in Joshua chapter 2 that when Rahab was talking about the fear that she and the people had of the Israelites, she mentions in verse 10 their crossing of the Red Sea and how the Lord had divided the Red Sea. And now as the people of God are crossing the Jordan River, the Lord does the same thing. The very things that the Canaanites had feared was now happening to this next generation of Jewish people. And so God was going with his people and he was going before them. They could rest assured that he was a part of this entire event and they were now going to the promised land. Moses was gone, but God was not gone. Now, one more comment as we talk about crossing the Jordan River here. Sometimes you might envision this being like a massive river, maybe like the Mississippi or the Delaware or something where it's like a half mile across and you really can't see to the other side. But that's not the case with the Jordan River really at all. These days, the Jordan River has a dam on it, so it's really small, like, you know, a handful of yards, 20 yards across or so. Verse 15 says that this was when the banks were overflowing, it was springtime. But even then, the Jordan River was a relatively small river. It'd only be maybe 100 feet wide or so. It might be 2 to 10 feet deep. It was enough to sweep away people, but it wasn't like crossing the mighty Mississippi. And my point in bringing that up is because this is a true miracle of the Lord. And sometimes people act as though God has like a game of one-ups in the ship where he does one miracle, next one's even bigger and even better. And here we're saying, no, God is just working. God will do what he has to do to accomplish his will. Sometimes it's like dramatically like crossing the Red Sea might just be the Jordan River. Either way, God is working. And when he is working, his people are to be in awe of him and to worship him. Now, what's the takeaway with all of this? I have a couple of thoughts from this passage here. First, back to verse 5. When we want the Lord to work amongst us, we need to be willing to be fully consecrated to him. God was bringing these people into his promised land, a land of holiness. They are about to receive an incredible miracle, an incredible gift of grace. And part of their reception of this gift is them being fully consecrated to the Lord that they might receive it. And I just think about our own lives as we think about like, well, I want God to bless me for this or that. So often what we want God to bless is our own thing. It's our own agenda. It's not his. And here we're seeing that these people, they were consecrated to the Lord and they saw God's blessings because they were fully dedicated to him. Likewise, this chapter also gives us another key to the nature of faith. Faith is taking God at his word and acting upon it. It's not waiting to see if God is going to do something and then we get involved. It's trusting in God and living in light of his promises. And you see that here in this passage. They had come all the way now to the edge of the Jordan River. This was the culmination of 40 years of judgment from the Lord. And now they got to really wrestle with, are we going to obey God or are we going to disobey like mom and dad did? And so they come to the edge of the Jordan River where God had said to the priests, carry the ark and put your feet into that river. And we see in verses 15 and 16 that it's when they put their feet in that river that the river stops. They had to first act in faith and obedience to the Lord. Along these same lines, sometimes when we're thinking about our life and things we want to do, and is this a good time and is God leading, we'll often strategize and game plan and try and figure out the best time to do it. And here, this is clearly not the best time. Verse 15 says, the banks are overflowing. This is the time when the Jordan's at its biggest. It's not a huge river, but certainly a dangerous river at this point. You can imagine people saying, hey, Joshua, let's wait a couple months. It's been 40 years. Let's just wait another month or two. Let's wait. Let the, let's let the banks go down. But that's not what Joshua does. He says, no, the Lord is calling us to cross now. We've got three days. It is now. And so this time they don't grumble. Uh, they don't complain. They don't say, you know what? Let's just go back to Egypt. They say, okay, let's do this. We trust God. He's gone before us. We're good. And so they do. And then they see this incredible miracle of the Lord. And so tying this into our own lives, if we're looking at the word of God saying, well, should I really obey this? At times it might feel like we're flying by instruments, that we're just in a fog. We really don't know where we're going. But when we look to the word of God and say, but here's what the verse says. Here's what the principle is. I'm just going to obey. That's when we're going to see God work. Finally, this passage and also Joshua chapter 4 mentions four specific reasons that God did this miracle. I just want to go over them, kind of touching upon chapter 4 a little bit as well. In verse 10, God explains that he would do this act so that people would know that he is the true God and that he was going before them to drive out the inhabitants of the promised land. 
They needed to see and know that just because Moses was gone, God was not. God was the one they were following, not Moses. The second reason that God gives that he did this is in verse 14, to confirm Joshua as the leader of the people. That even though God was going before them, he still had called Joshua to be their leader. The third reason is down in, in Joshua chapter 4, verse 24. And that includes us, so that we would know, so that all the people of the world would know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. And we're seeing the mighty hand of our God in this passage. And the fourth reason is also given in Joshua 4, 24, so that the children would see the pile of stones because they make a memorial, and the children would see that pile of stones and ask their parents about the mighty God they serve. And so those are the purposes. And so once again, we're seeing in all of this that God is working on behalf of his people and behalf of his plan. We don't always know what God is doing or why, but passages like this show us that God has a sovereign plan for his people. And as we are committed to him and walking in his ways, we will walk in his plan and his blessings. As we've said in previous studies, even if we do not have God's direct revelation like Joshua, where God's actually just talking to Joshua, we still have his revelation in the word of God to show us the way we should go. As we come to his word, as we believe it, as we step out in faith, we will walk in the blessings and the joy that he has promised to those who will follow him. And I hope as you're reading all of these chapters and you're thinking about these truths we've been going through for the last couple months, that you're seeing that God is worthy to follow and that you are stepping out as well and following him. So may that be your prayer today. It's my prayer for you. Hope you have a great day. We'll catch up with you tomorrow as we go to Joshua chapter 6 and the fall of Jericho. We'll see God's continued miraculous work amongst the people. We'll catch up with you then. Have a great day and God bless.